Hi, I'm Karen Hurd, and I'm here with our next edition of Asking for a Friend Live. And today we are going to be talking about being a leader teacher and how do you do that as a leader? And I'm delighted to bring forward this uh, wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Sidney Finkelstein uh, from Dartmouth. He's written a book, uh, Super Boss, his best selling book. He's uh, featured in Harvard Business Review. And I, I found uh, the, your work, uh, and I'm so delighted uh, to make this connection. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank, thank you, Karen, for inviting me. I love this uh, format of LinkedIn Live, and uh, uh, I'm excited to chat with you and, uh, and anyone else out there. All right, great. So if you are joining us, we hope you will bring your questions, just chat them in and we will be sure to answer them. So as uh, we're joining today, uh, I have been asking every guest uh, this question uh, to, to start, which is, you know, when you're reflecting on the last 18 months, which have been challenging, what has been a source of inspiration or strength for you? Yeah, so uh, it's been, I actually think about it as two years <laughs> uh, and uh, hopefully not counting anymore, fingers uh, fingers crossed. You know, uh, for, for me, it's been going back to some very simple, um, um, I don't know, philosophy or, or lessons about life. Uh, you know, people always say, stop and smell the flowers. Well, I've been doing that for the last two years, um, maybe not in winter in New England, but the rest of the time. And just going slower and, and breathing and, and taking time to talk to people and really talk to people. Uh, a lot of it was through, was through Zoom, to be sure. Um, but even, even there, you could make that, make that connection. So I think it's kind of doubling down on the human connections that we all have, that we sometimes are so busy doing all sorts of other things, but with... Um, with the pandemic, uh, travel stopped, at least for me, and a lot of other things slowed down. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I got my, uh, got my strength, my, uh, uh, my strength from so many other people and talking to them. Nice. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. That human connection has made all the difference. And I've met so many new people uh, over the last two years, which has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So you, you wrote this book called Super Bosses. Let me just start by asking you, what is a super boss? How would you define a super boss? Sure. So a super boss is a leader. This is the simplest definition. A leader that creates other leaders, which is kind of a big word to think about creating. Uh, another way of saying it is a super boss has a track record of generating and regenerating talent on a continual basis. These are people that see the potential in others. Uh, often before they see it themselves. And so it's exactly the type of person you want to work for at some stage in your career, especially uh, early on, but at any stage of your career. So that, that's what, I mean, these super bosses, they change people's lives for the better. Nice. Uh, and that's what was so intriguing to me about your work. And when I read uh, the your article in Harvard Business Review, it caused me to reach out. You know, our company is called Let's Grow Leaders. This is exactly what we're about, is helping leaders develop other leaders. Mm -hmm. So when I think about super bosses, and I was reading your book, you have three different categories of super bosses. And some of them actually surprised me a little bit because uh, they're not necessarily the people that you would think of mm -hmm. uh, the uh, traditional ways of developing people. So let's just talk about all three of those briefly. Uh, you got iconoclast to start. Let's yeah, iconoclast. so an iconoclast, these are the, the a bit more creative uh, people and they, um, they help other people get better by kind of creating a troop or a team of people that are advancing their uh, their, their own creative endeavors. So people like, you know, Miles Davis, legendary trumpeter is in that category. Maybe Ralph Lauren is even in that category. These are people that help others get better by surrounding and interacting. And, and the thing about them, and maybe you're alluding to this, is they don't necessarily care a ton about other people's development, uh, but they know that by interacting and creating that milieu, if you will, yeah. of working together, everybody gets better. And uh, it's surprising how often that happens, not just in creative industries. Nice, nice. And you have a nice long list in the book. I, it was really interesting. I was like, yeah, I, I could see that. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the one that scared me. The Glorious Bastards. So what is a yeah. Glorious Bastard? Yeah, so Glorious Bastard is, this is someone that is, uh, that wants to win. They want to win more than anything else at whatever their career is, wherever they want to do. But they have this, this essential understanding that to win, they need to surround themselves with superstar talent and they need to help get those people and continually get those people to be better and better and better. Th these people actually don't care about too many others. They care about winning. But because they have this understanding that to get to where they want to be, they can't do it alone. 
they end up being, you know, very tough bosses, not always easy to handle. You know, Larry Ellison, uh, classic, uh, you know, Silicon Valley of Oracle uh, CEO founder is, is kind of the, 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 a great example of that. Uh, it's not that easy to work for somebody like that, but if you can handle it, the acceleration of your career is, is really dramatic. So it's a type of thing that if you're thinking about that, you want to you wanna pick and choose. And probably you might not stay quite as long as you might for the third category that we're about to get to. Okay. So I was trying to decide, have I worked for a glorious bastard? And I think, no, they weren't glorious. <laughs> they were just <laughs> hard to work for. Uh, but yeah. what do you do if you are, are if, if you're, you're working for someone who you would identify as this? So um, you got to be you got to be all in. Uh, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, again, it's not for everyone, but for high aspiration people that want to uh, use the old-fashioned term, pay your dues um, for a short period of time, uh, the payoff the payoff is going to be big. And you're and you remember, it's not just your your boss that that has this attitude, but you are there with a team of people that all have the same boss, and and so you have that kind of you have that 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 support group. Um, someone I interviewed said that working for Larry Ellison, working one year for Larry Ellison was like working seven years for someone else mm -hmm. and kind of like dog years. Right. And what he meant by that is that the acceleration of your career is so extreme because of the pressure cooker environment you're in. And uh, again, not every, uh, and not every boss has that glorious side to them, but certainly these, uh, these super boss leaders did. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's get to the category that resonates most with me as a, you know, someone who really promotes human centered leadership, uh, the nurturers. Uh, yeah, what the is nurture, the nurturer? Yeah. It, you know, Karen, it's, it's probably the category people think of the most, you know, the boss that actually cares about you, wants to see you get better, wants to, wants to see you advance in your career, takes personal pride in helping you uh, reach your own goals. And these are wonderful, uh, wonderful bosses. And uh, the interesting thing about nurturers is sometimes I get pushback from people who say, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't have time. Uh, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody did that for me. But the thing that's really important about nurturers is while they're doing all these good things for other people, uh, of course, they themselves are going to get better and going to, going to be more successful because obviously you surround yourself with better people that keep getting better and better and, are, and feel right. a sense of loyalty towards you. Well, you know, you're going to end up getting those KPIs even better than before. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so we have some questions coming in. So let's go there. How does a super boss unleash constant creativity within their teams? Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, a great, great question. Constant creativity is the word constant gets me concerned. They, they are certainly very creative and push creativity. How do they do that? Uh, two or three different things. Number one, they model creativity, they model innovation, they care about it, and they act that way. Uh, these are people that are willing to take to take chances. Uh, number two, this is a classic around failure, right? Uh, if something goes wrong, how heavy is that punishment going to be on you? And for super boss leaders, uh, they don't want to see you fail. But if you fail for the right reasons, I mean, I'll give you a quick anecdote. Uh, Jay Shiat, who was the CEO and founder of Shiat Day, one of the big advertising agencies, uh, he had a team that um, uh, of creatives that did not get uh, a contract with a um, with a client because they were, and the reason they didn't get it is because they were a bit too far uh, out there for the client. The client was a little bit uncomfortable with, uh, uh, with let's say, the creativity or how avant-garde they were. And Jay Shiat said, well, you know, we didn't get the deal, but the reason why we didn't get the deal is the right reason not to get it, because we want to be on the edge. We want to be further than anyone else, because that's going to be, that's, a, that's really our superpower. And so he actually gave a bonus to those people who, uh, uh, who didn't get the contract. So that's kind of opposite, kind of really flipping the flipping the switch on um, um, on, on how we usually think about it. And the other quick thing I'll say about about creativity, besides modeling and besides managing it in terms of failure, is creating a culture of experimentation. And the key thing about experiment, this gets to the last point a little bit. Uh, the key thing about an experiment is it might not work. If you know that something is going to work, it's not an experiment. Jeff Bezos has said that, in fact. Uh, and, and so there is a risk of something not going, not going well. And, uh, and we've seen that in, in uh, we actually we've seen that with Amazon as they, they're closing various retail concepts and focusing on you know, Whole Foods and others. They made an experiment. Uh, they learned a lot. It didn't work. They decided to fold the tent. 
that's kind of what you do with an experiment. But some of those experiments, AWS, become multi-billion dollar businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very, uh, Anthony, your, your question is a perfect segue to where I wanted to head next, which is I was really intrigued by the pattern in your research that you were seeing across all three categories of your super bosses around this concept of clarity and innovation and how that comes together. And, you know, in our research, we did research on psychological safety as it relates to innovation. And one of the things that we found is that there was this clarity and then curiosity, and you've got to be toggling back and forth between clarity and curiosity, you know, that you really need to be clear that you want ideas, you need to be clear strategically where you're headed with a vision. And that enables people to be uh, curious. Uh, so uh, I've got some uh, different quotes here uh, that I pulled from your book. I just want to pull a couple of these up and then let's talk a little bit about this clarity and, and curiosity and innovation and how it all comes together. So uh, Jerry, if you want to pull up a couple of the, the, the quotes here. So I liked this. Employees cannot innovate in meaningful ways unless they have a frame in which to work. And the super boss's fundamental vision provides that grounding. So, you know, that one of the things that you were talking about is that th these super bosses are really clear right, about where they're headed. They have this vision. Uh, and so you want to talk a little bit more about, mm -hmm. about this? Yeah, I use the uh, term in the book, uncompromisingly open. And it gets to exactly what you're what you're talking about. They're uncompromising when it comes to their vision, their purpose, the reason why they're doing what they're doing. You know, someone like Alice Waters, a legendary a restaurateur and innovator uh, from Chef Panisse restaurant, still at it some 50 years since she started. Um, she had a vision of helping Americans or teaching Americans how to eat differently, meaning organic, farm to table, things that have become normal now, but in 1970 were, were not. You could not work for Alice Waters unless you bought into that vision. Mm. But as long as you were part of that, anything goes. Any idea you have, well, let's run with it. Let's try to figure it out. And so it's a there's a yin and a yang to this thing also, right? Because if you don't have that bedrock uh, vision as your as your grounding, then people can go off in all kinds of different directions, and you become uh, I hate to say it, but you become an academic department uh, where anyone could do any type of research, any type of project, and it's pretty it's it's pretty tough to run a business doing that. It, everything has to tie back to why are we in business? What is our team doing? What is our purpose? What is our vision? And and that turns out to give a great deal of confidence. And that's why that quote was was alluding to as well. Yeah. A great deal of confidence to people. Yes, uh, very, very, I was envisioning. So this, you, you've you got this vision and then you've got all of these ideas that there, it's almost like a vacuum pulling these, these ideas towards that vision mm -hmm. and being open to that. Uh, and you share some really powerful stories in your book. I encourage people to read those. All right, Jared, the next uh, quote here. Uh, you, you talk about when super bosses hire employees, they implicitly invite them to be part of this vision. They also invite them to buy into the mindset of openness and innovation that made that vision possible in the first place. And I'm curious, you talk a little bit about selecting, you know, how super bosses select talent, you know, and uh, how they communicate and get the right people. How do they know? Uh, what, what did you find there? Yeah, how, how do they know is an interesting question. Uh, I, I look at these super boss leaders when it comes to talent, hiring talent, um, in the same way that I think about entrepreneurs. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, or, or even if you're not, you haven't started a company, but you have this kind of entrepreneurial mindset, everywhere you go, you're thinking, how can we do this better? Why are they doing it that way? Can, can, we, can we kind of come up with a better solution? And that's how many companies actually start when, when, when someone is frustrated by, by a blockage, by a problem, and they want to create something. Super boss leaders think that way about talent. Everywhere they go, they're looking, could this, could this be somebody that could help us? Is this someone that could be actually, can, can actually um, uh, add some value to our team? And, 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 they're, and they're looking in a very, very broad, um, and let's say wide, wide way. So for example, I've heard this story, a version of this story must be a couple of dozen times, um, including after I wrote the book and, and done workshops and super bosses and people would tell me, yeah, you know what, that was cool what you said, but let me tell you my story. And, and the story, uh, there are many versions of it, but, but the most common is I'm in a restaurant. I was in a restaurant and my server was, was great um, and just really uh, enhanced the, the, the meal. And over the course of, 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 uh, of the dinner, I ended up chatting a bit more with the server and I even, and, and I gave him or her 
uh, my business card and said, you know, I'd love to stay in touch and maybe talk about uh, some career opportunities at our company. And, and that company had nothing to do with the restaurant business, nothing to do with serving. Why is that? Because the underlying skill set to be an effective server, what is that? Sales, right? Interpersonal skills, right? Having that kind of interaction, that, ty that type of skill set is valuable in so many, uh, so many different venues. That's why, by the way, during our uh, during this, this last couple of years, when when there's been such a shortage of talent across the across the country, even in many many countries, uh, teachers have gotten all kinds of new opportunities completely out of schools, uh, working for companies because they have those underlying skill sets. So, uh, super bosses look uh, broadly; uh, they don't narrow their their focus. I, I I call them people that go after untapped talent pools, places that others haven't looked, and uh, and you can see that creativity. And openness is essential to being able to do that. Yeah. I was smiling when you were saying that because if there's anyone who worked on my uh, sales team at Verizon, so I had, uh, I was leading a large sales team. And one of the things that my district managers and I did every mm -hmm. single time we were out to dinner, we'd be like, all right, we're going to hire this person <laughs> every single time. <laughs> there's a great way to source talent for the Verizon stores uh, because it's, it, you're right, transferable skill set. All right. I'd like to switch now over to what really um, how I found you, which was through your Harvard Business Review article on leaders as teachers. And I would like to get as practical as we can. So, you know, uh, you know, people are saying, yeah, I'm never going to be Miles Davis, you know, but I do want to really be a you know, I really do want to grow leaders. I really want to um, be a people developer. I want people to come away from working on my team being better and uh, have learned a lot. So how do I do that? And how do I be a leader teacher? So I want to start just any general comments that you have. And then you talk about three types of lessons, which I thought would be interesting to chat about as well. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's a lot to say about this. Uh, it really was one of the absolute hallmarks of super boss leaders, the way they were, they were teachers, they were teaching people and they, and they, and, and the teaching takes place kind of in a very organic manner, you know, day to day, whenever the opportunity arises, you're sharing an Uber, going to a meeting, there's a chat that's going on. Um, it's not just formal meetings. It's not, it's certainly not presentations. Uh, and even, you know, in the last two years, as people have been working so, uh, remotely so much more, it's a little bit tougher, but it's still doable. And you, you have to kind of, you can't do it quite as uh, organically in that you have to set it up, you have to set up the Zoom, but they're doing it. And, and so these Suras leaders, Consider it part of their job, uh, and the and the reason they do again gets back to especially the nurturers, but all three of the types we talked about earlier. They know that that for for, for them to be successful, they really do want to have great people on their team. We always know that, but they're willing to go the extra step and do something about it. So uh, you talk about three types of lessons: uh, professionalism, points of craft, and life lessons. Can you talk a little bit about some of those? Yeah, sure. So professionalism is kind of. Um, how do you carry yourself? Um, how do you prepare? How do you how do you prepare for a meeting? How do you communicate? Uh, how do you sell um, whatever it is you're 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 selling? And um, um, and there's a strong um, this is across the board a strong grounding in integrity and and high ethical standards. If you're going to be you know management, if you will, is not a profession in the way that law or medicine is a profession. And I think everyone. Um, um, watching and listening know that um, we've had there probably had a lot of managers that were far from professional and so there's a lot of variation what these super boss leaders teach is how to become more of a professional how to follow certain standards and there's some specifics around that but certainly integrity ethics uh, and uh, and showing up in, in the way a professional would which is doing your homework being being prepared uh, thinking through how you're going to try to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, treating other people with respect, and uh, and as I said, always uh, always with high integrity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Ryan uh, has an interesting comment here. She says, "Yeah, first comes recognition by leaders that what they've been taught traditional leadership no longer works, right? And that servant leadership does. And I think that's uh, so true when you think about what as a leader teacher." What are you teaching? And it's not necessarily just what you've been taught. Uh, so mm -hmm. is that what you saw that super bosses really yeah. carve their own way? So uh, that's a really interesting question. So what do you teach? Do you teach only the things you've done yourself? 
Um, and the answer is, uh, answer is no, because you can't possibly have done everything. Right. Um, there are certain aspects from your own personal experience that are going to be going to be relevant, but they also teach mindset. You know, we talked about innovation quite a bit. They certainly teach sometimes through osmosis, th- sometimes through modeling, sometimes through specific interaction, um, uh, how to be and how to think about being uh, being innovative, uh, regardless of how innovative they may have been they may have been before. Uh, servant leadership, it's it's not unrelated to super bosses, but it's not the, a term I would use when I think about the uh, the iconoclasts or certainly the glorious masters. They, they don't think of themselves as servants to anyone. But when you go and look at what the behavior actually is, there is some overlap actually. There is some, um, there is some consistency there. The other thing that's important here is super boss leaders are big time learners. They love to learn. Um, in fact, even Larry Ellison, uh, who you know certainly is is in the category of the super tough, glorious bastard boss, uh, he would be thrilled if someone had something to teach him that he didn't know. And it wouldn't be that he would just kind of nod his head and say, "Thanks, I got, uh, that's great." You'd have to defend your point of view. Uh, you'd have to sometimes convince him, but that's completely legit. You got to be able to back up and articulate whatever it is that your your point of view is. Mm-hmm. We teach our our MBA students that uh, all the time. And so they're, they're constant learners. And when you're a constant learner and you love that learning, um, you, you all of a sudden have more and more to teach every day because every day you've thought about something different and, and you want to share it. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious about some practical techniques. If somebody says, yeah, I want to do this. I really, really want to be somebody who is thinking this way, doing this way. You know, I was thinking about some of the, you know, things that I have done over the years in terms that were really practical that feel like this genre of things. You know, one of the things is when people are uh, experiencing a heavy emotion, right? They've, Mm -hmm. something has happened. It's not gone well. They've been treated poorly. Stopping and having them process what has happened. What did you call, what was your part of the situation? What are you observing about how other people are behaving? What do you want to uh, know? Mm-hmm. What do you want to learn from this? And you know, like using teachable moments along the way. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, uh, you know, what kinds of techniques you would recommend? Yeah, there, there really there really are a lot. Um, so here's, here are a couple of suggestions. Uh, first, uh, customize how you work with people on your team. And by customizing, I, I, I mean specifically recognizing that not everyone is the same. Well, we all knew that. But uh, therefore, why do we treat everyone in exactly the same way? Now, we treat everyone the same way in terms of ethical, in terms of ethics and fairness. Yes. But what, say, you might need from your boss might be different from what Jared might need from his boss because you're in different stages of a career or you're just different personalities. And super boss leaders spend the time by, by talking, by interacting, and then working directly um, with, um, with people on their team to figure out the best way that they can work to, to fulfill their potential. So this could be very specific, like what hours do you want? We're in a modern world where you know, people are working from home still and it's not going to, it's not going to go away. It's, going to be a hy- it's already a hybrid. It's going to stay as a hybrid. Well, some people really like that. Other people want to be in the office. Figure, figure out what works best for each person. Why do you need to have exactly the same rule for the 10 people that are in your team that they all have to work from home or they all have to come in only on Mondays or what have you? Where's the logic in that? And that's just one kind of tip of the iceberg type of thing that you could think of in terms of, in terms of customizing. Um, a, a second idea uh, that I think is, is, is one that I've seen, I've, it's happened to me and it's happened to many people I, I interviewed and talked to, is, is around creating opportunities for learning. And this, uh, this requires delegation, you know, it's no secret that delegation is, is critical, but not everyone is that great of a delegator. Whenever you mention, or you think about a boss that's a micromanager, well, delegation is the farthest thing from his or her mind. But, you know, effective leaders are always, uh, are always great delegators and they create these, um, uh, and they'll create opportunities for people on their team. You know, in some of the, some of the executive coaching I've done over the years, sometimes I'll have someone tell me, uh, you know, I'm burned out. I just, you know, I'm, it just seems like I keep working and working and working. One of the first things uh, I'll try to dig into, try to diagnose what's going on, is how they are interacting with their subordinates, with their with their uh, team members, and especially uh, how much they're delegating. And it turns out that more often than not, people that feel this 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 burnout, it's all on them. They don't have anyone on their team, or they for various reasons are not actually delegating a lot or delegating effectively. And uh, it's, it's not possible in the kind of world we're in today. 
where you know there are shortages of talent everywhere. You got to use everyone on your team, and you got to find the right way to to create that opportunity for each person on the team. This is something that sports coaches have done for years. Um, Bill Walsh, the legendary San Francisco 49er uh, NFL coach, uh, Bill Belichick more more recently, you find the types of things that each player in your team can excel at. It's not the same for everyone. And you create an environment where they can step in and they can have an impact. And that's what and, and that requires pretty smart delegation. So those are a couple of thoughts around customization, around delegation, around opportunity, uh, opportunity setting for people on your team. All right. Excellent. You know, it's interesting. I like this question. This will be the last question uh, before I invite you to give us your final thoughts here. Uh, Ryan is saying, what if it doesn't come naturally? And I was thinking about the people who I would say are super bosses that I've worked mm -hmm. with. And, you know, you know, almost feels like it's just instinctual that they do this. Mm -hmm. So what if I want to do it and it's not in my genes? Yeah, this is another great uh, question. Um, I, in my research, I kind of reverse engineered what people, what, what these people did. Uh, and then I laid it all out and say, okay, here are the things that you can do. And you, you mentioned the super bosses book, obviously that's kind of the core book. There was a follow-up book called the super bosses playbook that actually gives you practical exercises oh. to learn how to do all the things we've been, we've been talking about. Uh, these are exercises I've used in my, in my workshops for years. And there's, there's something like 40 of them. You can pick and choose the right, the right ones. And, and this is important. It turns out that every one of these things that we've been talking about and much more that's that we learned about super bosses is, is learnable. It's teachable and it's, uh, and, and it's learnable. And so, yeah, you know, some people are, are born with the right DNA or uh, for, for certain things. I, I got that. But does that mean the rest of us are, are going to just be kind of not close to fulfilling our potential? Uh, there's no way I would believe a thing like that. I wouldn't be a teacher if I thought that was the case. Uh, and, and in fact, I know from this research, factually, it's not, it's not correct. Um, anyone can learn how to be a super boss, uh, a super boss leader. You have to want to do that. You have to want to, you have to want to do it first and foremost. And, and that means learning what it's about as we've been talking about today, but also beginning to adopt that, that mindset. And, um, and the mindset says, you know, don't tell somebody what to do, uh, give them the guidelines, um, and see what they come up with. Uh, and you're not going to give them months to figure figure that out. You could give them a day or two to figure that out, and and then you interact, and they may come up with something that's better th better than what what you have, uh, as as yet another another type of example. So, um, and uh, one one other thing to keep in mind, I would say between introvert and extrovert that many people you know talk about, very intuitive. Super bosses are probably fifty fifty. You might think that they're extroverts because they have this kind of inspirational. No, they, they're, 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 some are and some are not. And, but they know how to step up and speak when they need to speak, uh, when they need to articulate. I mean, my, just myself, I'm, I'm actually quite an introvert, but I know how to step up and communicate when there's something I really care about. And why can't we all do that? Mm -hmm. And they're spending that introverted time on the vision. So it's that it's mm -hmm. that balance. Yeah, great. So uh, we're uh, coming up to the top of the hour here. So thank you. This ha time has flown. I would love for you to tell people about your latest project, which we were chatting about pre-show, and anything else where they can find you. And one, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Right, right. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, the time really flew really flew by, which is always the hallmark of a good conversation. Um, so uh, I am um, uh, soon about to launch. Uh, four new courses on Coursera. It's the first time I'm doing anything like this. It's kind of my life's work, if you will. Four courses. One of the four is on super bosses specifically, but there are three others uh, based on work that I've done, books that I published, and even the fourth course, which is much more about wisdom and personal leadership that I actually have not written much about. I'm very, very excited about it. It's launching at the end of March, um, and it's a great way for people to kind of um, learn and, and, and learn about some of the things I've been thinking about and doing for for, for decades and, uh, and I've made it extremely, extremely practical. Um, the other way to kind of stay in touch with work that I'm doing, things I'm doing, and you see this in the lower third here, is my podcast, uh, the SIDCAST. Um, I'm soon gonna start season four. Um, this is where I talk to really, really fascinating people about their lives and about what they've learned and a little bit about leadership, but a lot about people and, and, and the career paths they've been on. So those are a couple of places to look, uh, to stay in touch. And if I were to have one final comment uh, about super bosses, um, we only get one shot at this. We only get one round. 
why wouldn't we want to go for it? Why wouldn't we want to try to be the best we possibly can? Why wouldn't we want to create a culture and environment in our organizations that is all about change and adapting and getting better and better and better? I mean, that's what I'm about. That's what I've, I've lived my life trying to do. And, and I know I could get a lot better with that, but that's what we should be going for. And that's what super boss leaders do. That's the lesson they share with us. And I hope that'll be a lesson for all of uh, all of your listeners and viewers as well. Ken. Uh, beautiful. Thank you so very much. It was an absolute uh, pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Karen. All right. So we have a fabulous lineup uh, coming forward on asking for a friend. Uh, we're going to ha be talking with Amir Cassie on um, author of Ambitious. So, you know, I always talk about, David and I always talk about confident humility. He is talking about humility and ambition. And it is it is the best laid research on humility that I have ever seen. It's a very, 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 very good book. Uh, Jennifer Moss, uh, nobody's got this issue right now, do we? Uh, burnout, the burnout epidemic. Again, an incredible book that she's written. And then Rita McGrath is going to be talking about seeing around corners and uh, how do you think strategically when you don't know what's coming next? So lots of timely topics uh, for us next time on Asking for a Friend.